it's timeless. It says in John 1, 1 that the word was with God at the very beginning. When I encounter the scriptures and when I go to them and, and I'm like trying to control them and get something out of it for my performance, I'm actually missing the purpose of them. Uh, and our approach should be a surrender to say, oh my goodness, God, like this word has been around for forever. And I just, I want to read it because I love you. And I want to read it because I want your will to be done for you to stir within me the deep meanings of these scriptures. It's, it's such a good morning to be with you. I'm, it, I said this first service, but just hearing Michelle's uh, just testimony, wasn't that powerful stuff? God's just so good. And um, as I was sitting this morning, even before first service, um, you know, you, I prepare and you, you get a message and I do this, you know, quite a bit every single week for students and then occasionally for, for our church here, um, the main service. And you know, when you go get up in front and uh, get up in front and speak in front of everybody, you kind of get kind of nervous, and especially when you have to like tell them something that they should know or try to teach something. It kind of gets that pressure. But after this morning, like just hearing Michelle's uh, testimony, you know, I was just sitting there and um, like, man, God, you're just good. And and that's what that's what God was just putting on my heart in the moment. Like, aren't I just really good? And I'm like. Yeah, and I'm like, it's so easy to talk about Jesus because he's always good. And I was, it makes our job actually pretty easy. There's not a lot of pressure when you're talking about like the best lover of humans on the earth, Jesus. Like he's so good. So I'm so excited to just share with you what God's put on my heart. And hopefully as we leave today, we'll all have that feeling deep in our heart that Jesus is just so good. Um, so would you stand with me as we read our scriptures today? Um, you know, we're, we're in our series uh, called Consecrated by God's Word. Um, so we're talking about the scriptures. We're talking about the Bible. Um, and I was trying to find a verse that like kind of encapsulated what I wanted to talk about. I'm, I'm trying to find a scripture to talk about the scriptures. Um, so it took me a while to actually nail down what I wanted to like use as this main verse um, because there's a lot of scriptures that talk about the scriptures. Anyways, um, I ended up at Luke 24. Um, and just a little background, these are two disciples. They're walking um, on this road uh, to a village called Emmaus. And they, this is post-Jesus being crucified, and they're talking about what happened. So it says, now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what, more, and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels um, who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had said. They did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish are you? Don't you love Jesus? He just kind of right to the point. How foolish are you? And slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and he broke it and gave thanks and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and then he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while you talk with us on the road and open the scriptures to us? This is God's word for us. You may be seated. I'm going to pray for us as we get started. Jesus, just like these two disciples, as we encounter you, God, through your word today, would, you, would your words just burn within us? Will we leave changed and transformed because of your words? Pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I want to do something with you this morning. Um, I, want to, I want to invite you into uh, my mind uh, in preparation for most of my messages. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's helpful for me to kind of uh, 
empathize with you and for you to empathize with me um, in the ways that we kind of um, experience this space here. I don't know. I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, let's do something fun. So I'm going to help you understand where I'm at, and then you, um, you're going to help me understand where you're at. Does that sound good? Because when I prepare a message, um, the primary thing that I'm like focusing on, other than like just like the content, obviously, is thinking about the people that are listening. I'm thinking about you guys. I'm thinking about the, whether it's students or adults or anybody in between. I'm thinking about, okay, I have this topic or this piece of scripture or this truth that I want to speak, and I want to make sure that it makes sense to everybody in the room, right? Because we all have different lives. We all experience different things. Your life is not like mine, and my life is not like yours. Unless you're 25 and have four kids and are crazy like me, uh, then you're like, oh yeah, you're like, I don't think I want that, okay? So, uh, so we have different lives. We experience different things. So I'm thinking, okay, where are they at right now? What are they going through? What are the situations that they're encountering? You know, what, what are the things that they're processing in life right now? Um, and then I pray, and I'm like, well, God, there's all these things on the table. Everybody's experiencing all these different things. So somehow, like, because you're awesome, w- would you just align whatever I say to match where they are right now in their life. So I've been thinking about you guys a lot this week. Like, what, what are you going through? What are the situations? And I've been really thinking about this in regards to reading scripture. Where are people at in regards to reading scripture? What are the challenges that they're facing when it comes to picking up the Bible and reading it and receiving the life that is within those pages? So um, I have to say this. I'm not, I don't know everybody's life personally. I don't know all your deepest, darkest secrets and all your struggles. And I don't, want to know because that's super personal and maybe uncomfortable for you. Um, but I want, to, um, I want to tell you the challenges that I face, and I want to talk about some of the challenges that you might face um, when it comes to reading the Bible. So here's a couple that I thought about that some, maybe some of you struggle with. Maybe understanding it, understanding the Bible, right? I, I, has there been times where you pick up the Bible and you read it and you're like, nice, I got nothing from that. Like, what, is, what was that? You know, um, there's been times like when I was, you know, a freshman in high school, we, we read in Iliad. Um, I still don't know what that book's about. I read it. I did. I was actually diligent. I'm still like, I have no idea what I just read. Um, so sometimes understanding the Bible can be kind of a challenge, right? So, and then it's, it's studying it, right? And there's so many complexities and uh, you're like, you can study the Bible for years and years and years and still feel like you just scratched the surface. is a challenge. Anybody like have kids and you're like, well, at 6 a.m. they wake up and they go to sleep at a later time. And if they are, if we're lucky, they take a nap. Like me and my wife, we have like prayer and fasting every noon. We're like, can they please God put them for a nap, Lord, let slumber come over them in Jesus name. We're like praying, God, open up the heavens to give my children sleep, please. So sometimes it's like finding the time, having kids, Um, can also just be a challenge of just picking up and finding time to read it. Um, There's also parts of the Bible that like feel slow and there's like a lot of information. Like you go through Numbers, Leviticus, the first chapter of Matthew, I almost gave up. It's all these lineages and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm reading right now. I can't say half of these names. So sometimes it's like the slow parts, the confusing parts. Um, They're hard to get through. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is the pressure of performance. Um, You're like, man, I'm a Christian. I should read the Bible, but I don't really want to. Or like, I feel like I'm not really good at it or I don't really understand it, right? So, and then there's the situations we're going through. Life gets tough, life gets, life gets busy and we're trying to figure out like uh, what's, what's more important. And then there's just like basic, like, oh man, like I'm, I'm busy, I'm tired. I'm like going through these different situations. The Bible is a big book, it's intimidating. Like, I don't know if I have like the desire to just, jump in. So those are the, some of the situations that I think that some of you are facing, and some of those are true for me, but there's, there's some particular ones that are hard for me too. Some particular challenges that, honestly, I, can you not judge me? Is that, is this like Planet Fitness, no judgment zone? Are we all agreeing? Because I'm like, yeah, the guy the, telling you about the Bible is like, yeah, here's my problems, okay? So I'm just going to be, I'm just being honest with you. Um, one of them is lack of desire. Like, I struggle with, like, the lack of desire to read the Bible. I know. I, it's bad, okay? I'm working through it with Jesus. It, it's because that most of the time when I'm picking up the Bible, it's for work. It's for writing a sermon. It's for studying. It's for, you know, being up on my knowledge of the scriptures and studying and being, 
you know, the, the good pastor Christian Manny, you know, trying to pick up the Bible and learn more and, you know, have great messages that impress you guys and, uh, you know, that make a difference in the student's lives. So sometimes when I look at the scripture, it automatically triggers my brain to think I'm working. So there's sometimes a lack of desire because some of you don't want to show up for work some days too, right? Some of it, and most of the time, is performance. Like, I want to be good at it. Right? So there's this pressure to, like, to know it, to master it, to memorize it, to have all the answers for all those crazy questions that come at me every Wednesday night from students, you know, and to, to have an answer for things. And it's the pressure to perform, right? And, and sometimes when I read the scriptures, I, I just, I want you guys to, to understand them and to know them. So there's this pressure of just like, oh, like when I, when I go to the Bible, it's like, oh man, I feel pressured to get it right, to know it all. And that can actually get in the way. And then on top of that, then there comes the shame of like, oh man, I haven't read the Bible in a couple of days. And like, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor. Like I should, I should be reading the Bible. So there's this shame that comes on. And then this one's hard for me too, the comprehension. I've always had time reading and comprehending. I don't know why, I, it, something in my brain, it takes me a while, I have to read slow, I have to read it over and over and over again, and sometimes that just gets frustrating because I'm like, I just wanna read it and get it. Anybody like that? I'm like, I sometimes dread reading anything because I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm a fearful that I'm not gonna get it. You know, in high school, I used to be so, like in middle school, I used to be so scared to, to read, and they, they make you read, and like, so what'd you get from that? I'm like, the title? I don't know. What else? Like, what else am I supposed to get from it? I don't know. You know, so comprehension can be a big, uh, like, part of it. And then, and then the last one is because, like, it's part of my job to know the scriptures and to teach them. A lot of the times when I engage with the scriptures, I find a lot of information, but I lack finding God's presence. And that's really, really hard. The Bible is full of a bunch of concepts and theology and complexities and literary styles and prophecies and metaphors and all these different things. And I actually found that, for me at least, and I think actually for most of us too, the, the problem or the struggle or the biggest challenge of Scripture is not to actually figure out all the complexities and understand them. That's actually not the biggest challenge. Although it's daunting and you look at your Bible, it's kind of thick and there's so much in there and it's, it's vast and it's a lot of knowledge in there. I don't think the biggest problem is actually reading it to understand and to work out those complexities. I think the biggest problem for most people when it comes to picking up the Bible is reading it and finding intimacy and presence with Jesus. I think that sometimes we read and we find information and cool facts, but we actually miss an encounter with the presence of God. There's an old folktale that tells a story of this scholar who spent his life studying ancient texts. He sought to understand every nuance and every hidden meaning. And one day, he discovered a map to a great treasure. Excited, he meticulously analyzed the map, deciphering its symbols and plotting every detail. And years passed, and the scholar grew old, never having set foot on the journey to find the treasure. He knew the map better than anyone, but he never experienced the treasure itself. I think a lot of us with the scriptures, we have the same experience. We can know the scriptures like the back of our hand, but miss the encounter with the great treasure that's hidden between the lines, and it's Jesus. I've had the pri privilege of learning and sitting under some really good leaders. One of them is Larry Spousta. You'll hear most of our staff talk about Larry because he's like, he's like Yoda, but loves Jesus. I don't know. Like he's just, I'm like, Larry, tell me about life and help me. Please give me the answers. And him and a couple other leaders, they've just taught me something so important about following Jesus, and it's this. It's that every spiritual discipline, every spiritual practice, everything that we do um, in those giving and worship and serving the poor and serving the church and tithing, whatever it may be, reading scripture, all of these things are to the end of actually experiencing the presence of God. And I just want to be honest with you. There's times where I'm giving, and it's because that's what we do right? That's what we do as Christians. We tithe. We give 10%. That's what we do. And sometimes we give above and beyond that. But there's moments where I'm giving and in my heart, I'm not experiencing the presence of God. It's times where I like, I drop that envelope in the bucket, but I'm not thinking about it, man. I'm experiencing God's presence in this. So it's, it's sometimes hard to really think about these practices as not just things that we do to be good Christians, but things we do to actually encounter the person of Jesus. That's the purpose of them, that we would read scripture and give and serve and worship. And in those things, we experience the one 
who is the lover of our soul. The Bible is insanely transformative for us. It can just turn our entire lives around but the primary goal or desire or motivation of reading this scripture shouldn't be that we get something from it. It's that we would encounter God through it and in it. Robert Mulholland says it really well. He says this, the goal of scripture is that we would know God better, not that we would know the scriptures better. I read this and I was like, I'm going to send that to Pastor Isaac. I'm like, is this heresy? I'm like, I don't know, because this goes so much against what I've been taught, is that you, you learn the scriptures and you memorize them and you master them, because that's what it means but to, to be a Christian. But what, what Robert Mulholland is inviting us into is that we would experience the scriptures as a place and an invitation to know God through them. I love this because it takes the performance out of it for us, and it makes us just encounter the God who's speaking through his word. So my goal today is this, is that we would look at scripture a different way. That we would actually encounter it in a way where when we walk away, we're like those disciples on the road to Emmaus. That our hearts would burn because God has spoken something to us through his word. Not that we found something or extracted it or studied it, but that we'd walk away with our hearts burning because the voice of God and the Holy Spirit has spoken to us through the word. So I've thought about some ways where I've, I have changed my view on scripture in the way that I engage it so that I can actually experience the presence of God and not just be always information grabbing. So the first one is this, reading God's word for God's purposes, not personal performance. Read for God's purposes, not personal performance. Our culture has really affected the way that we do everything. Because we're such achievers, right? We like to do things. We like to achieve. We like to mark the box. We like to check it off. How many of you like like to check off that list? You're like, yeah, you're like, got it, done. And when you look at that list and you see all those check marks, you just sit back and you're like, the Lord is good. (laughs) Like, he's really good, you know? And believe it or not, I'm a check, I'm a checkbox person. Like, I love, see, because I'm like, I did it. I did it. I'll send my wife. I'm like, I got everything done today, sweetie. Woo, I did it. Because I'm an achiever, right? And, and I, want, I want to perform well. I want to do well, which is not a bad desire. But what performance can do is it could steal the intimacy right out of the spiritual practices for us, especially God's word. Because we feel like we have to uh, extract and master the text. We feel like we have to pull out everything instead of letting God's purposes be God's purposes and his will be done and him speak to us, right? So sometimes my motivation Brian reading scripture, I'm just going to be honest with you because I love the Bible app. How many of you have the Bible app? You should download it. It's a great app. There's one thing that I don't like about it. I'm just to be honest with you. Sorry, Craig Rochelle. I love you. There's one thing that I don't like about it is that the little streak thing. I don't, I don't like it because it makes me feel bad, okay? Like it does because sometimes I'm like, I'm like, yo, I got a good streak on the Bible app. Like I'm a Christian, like for real, you know? And when the verse of the day, when the verse of the day is like good, like real good, I'm not talking about like those other scriptures, I'm talking about like the, the real good ones, I'll have to show somebody like, hey, did you see uh, the verse of the day? And right above it is the streak. And I'm like, just look above that. You're just saying, I'm like, I've been reading every day, um, right? Because it's a, it's a place of performance. So that streak, like, to me, I'm like, well, I don't want to lose that. That's, that's a good number. I don't want to lose that. So, so I wake up in the morning, and I'm going throughout my day, and I'm like, wait, hold up. Did I pick up the Bible today? I'm going to lose my streak. I'm like, no. I'm like, if I lose my streak, I'm not even talking to my wife all day. I'm like, I don't want to talk. I just, uh, something happened to me today. I lost my streak on the Bible app. And... But seriously, so sometimes, sometimes when I open the Bible app, it's not for the purpose of encountering the presence of Jesus. It's to keep my achievement up. And what happens in my heart is that I miss the encounter with the presence of God who's inviting me to experience his love and to worship him deeper. And that should be our, our heart. And I think that if we actually engage the scriptures for that purpose, we'd, be, we'd have much more of a desire to do it. Where it's not I'm just doing it to keep the Bible app streak up or to not look, you know, look like a bad Christian, but I'm engaging it because I want to meet Jesus within those texts. I want to encounter the presence of God. So I think that we have to actually change the way that we view it to say, God, I want to read the scriptures for your purposes. 
But because this is like, just think about this. The word of God has existed. It's timeless. It says in John 1, 1 that the word was with God at the very beginning, right? So this word that we're reading, this, these scriptures that we're reading, they've been exi- in existence for forever, for forever. So I'm like, when I encounter the scriptures and when I go to them and, and I'm like trying to control them and get something out of it for my performance, I'm actually missing the purpose of them. Uh, and our approach should be a surrender to say, oh my goodness, God, like this word has been around for forever. And I just, I want to read it because I love you. And I want to read it because I want your will to be done and for you to stir within me the deep meanings of these scriptures. This is what Richard Rohr says. I love this. He says, we must approach the scriptures with humility and patience, with our own agenda out of the way, and allow the spirit to stir the deeper meaning for us. This next part kills me. (laughs) Otherwise, we only hear what we already agree with or we have already decided to look for. It's like, I'm like, oh my goodness. Sometimes when I'm reading scripture, I already have what I'm looking for on my mind before I get there. And I use them to just be like, I'm right. Thank you, God. Appreciate that. Check. Instead of engaging them and saying, God, no, I'm surrendering to a word that is so infallible and perfect. And I'm allowing you to actually speak to me what you want me to learn and what you want me to um, absorb. So we have to actually put our agenda out of the way and allow the spirit to come in and begin to stir those deeper meanings for us. We have to read the Bible for God's purposes, not for our personal performance. And what are God's purposes? I just put a few up here. These are not the only ones, but very simply to connect to us, to transform us, and to teach us. These are his purposes. So that when we encounter the scriptures, when we approach it with this heart of surrender, God begins to speak to us the deeper meanings that he has for us. And it begins to revolutionize the way that we experience those things. And they begin to burn in our heart. God speaks the deeper meanings and we walk away not with saying I've done it, but saying, man, God has spoken to me and those words are burning within my heart. The second one is reading for transformation, not only information. I said not only because reading for information is great. Studying scripture is amazing. You should do it. It, is, it unlocks so much knowledge about the Bible and actually opens up the story for us. It's so beneficial. But what I find is that I often go to the Bible for an information grab, not for intimacy. I, don't, I go there not to be transformed, but to get more knowledge. And I think that sometimes when we engage only with our mind, we actually hit a wall at some point where we need something else. So I had to teach myself, hey, I need to engage the scriptures in a way where I'm seeking the transformation of God, not just information more about him, right? So... I'll give you an example. Psalm chapter one has been really on my heart um, this whole week. I don't know why. God just put it on my heart. So I just started reading it. So there's a difference between reading for transformation and information. Because in transformation, if you want to put up that next slide, transformation is when we engage the heart. But information is when we engage the mind. And both are good. So when I'm reading Psalm chapter one, the, the main scripture that kind of spoke to me as I was reading it was the tree planted by the streams of water, it bears fruit in every season. So if I'm engaging the scriptures with my mind, I'm like really thinking about that logically. So I'm like, okay, well, trees don't bear fruit in every season because there's seasons where it's cold, right? So I'm an Adams County resident now, just letting you know. So um, before when I went to to the supermarket, I'm like, apples grow year round, baby. They're always available. Let's go. But they don't. There's seasons to grow apples, right? I didn't know that, but here we go. Uh, I, I'm learning, all right? So I realized that this verse, like when I'm engaging with it with my mind, I'm realizing like, oh, like a tree doesn't bear fruit in every season because there's times where it's not in season, right? They're like, oh, strawberries are not in season, so it doesn't bear fruit. So I'm like, well, this tree is different because it's planted by the water, which obviously in my mind like represents living water. It's bearing fruit in every season. So even in the winter, it's bearing fruit. So my mind is engaging. I'm like, whoa, that can preach. Let's go. I'm going to write some notes about that. I'm like, man, like if you stay planted by the streams of water, like you'll bear fruit in times where it's busy, when times where you're anxious, when times where you're depre- depressed. Like God will, if you're planted in him. So that's my mind being engaged, right? Well, when I engage my heart, it's a completely different process. I'm engaging with the scripture differently. So when I'm, I'm coming to the scripture and I'm reading it, 
and I'm allowing, right, first God's purposes to be done. I'm surrendering. God, I'm reading your scripture. Do whatever you want. Speak to me whatever you want. I'm open to you. Speak to me the words of life. Burn those words in my heart. So I gauge my heart. I start to think about, okay, am I that tree planted by the streams of water? Am I bearing fruit in every season? And then I start to get kind of offended. I'm not being, I'm being honest. I'm like, no. What does that mean? You know, so I, then we're, so when we're engaging with the heart, we're engaging with our soul. We're engaging with our heart and our soul and we're responding to those things. And now we're thinking about the inner workings of our life. So I know why God put Psalm chapter one on my heart this week because I engaged with it with my heart. And as I began to read the, the scriptures there, I realized that we're in camp season and it's really busy and for the next three weeks, I'm gonna be running around with, like a chicken with my head cut off. It's busy and I was so stressed this week, so stressed. And I felt myself distancing and trying to do everything on my own. So God put Psalm chapter one on my heart. I started to engage with it and to realize that there's some dynamics in my life right now that are causing me to not be planted by the streams of water. And I started to realize, man, God, I feel like I don't bear fruit when it's hard. And that is challenging to me. Then I begin to think about, okay, God, would your spirit like, would you fill the areas when I'm anxious? Help me to bear fruit. Help me to rely on you. Help me to be planted near you. See how I'm engaging my heart? I'm allowing the scriptures to seep into me, but that's God's purposes. I had no idea why I, Psalm chapter one was on my heart. But as I began to engage with them, uh, with my heart, I began to understand the meaning of what God was stirring underneath the surface. And I began to experience that transformation. And I'm like, man, God, being with you right now through your scriptures and through your words, it makes me feel like I'm that tree. And I'm feeling the life again. So engaging with the mind is that studying, the information grab, the connecting the dots and concept, breaking down the theology, but the engaging the heart is listening to God to connect with him relationally. It's responding with our heart and our soul, not just with our intellect. And as we're doing that, we're engaging with the inner dynamics and asking the tough questions. God, is, why have you put the scripture on my heart? Why is it offending me? Why is it making me feel kind of distanced? Why am I not like kind of jiving with that, you know, and we're asking the deeper questions and God begins to stir those things. Reading for transformation allows the scriptures to act as like a different kind of tool that illuminates the parts of our lives that need healing, that need restoration, that need the light shown on it. It's a place where God comes in with his presence and his intimacy and begins to heal and forgive and to restore us. Scripture is so powerful. Actually, my youth pastor growing up, he used to say this before every message. He, he would say, God's word is, and we all say good stuff. You want to do it with me? God's word is? Good stuff. It sure is. So I have my friend Becca. She's one of our students in uh, Foursquare Youth. She's going to come up and share with you um, a life journal. Uh, this is the way that we read scripture, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And she's going to share that. Would you give her a hand as she comes? Good morning. So I was reading in Genesis, Genesis 2, 5. It says, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet set rain to water the earth. And there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered the land. My observation was to me, the land represents our dry, broken, and starving world. God had not yet set the water, or the living water, meaning Jesus, to quench our thirst. But once God sent the water in the very beginning, it flowed throughout the earth. Just like when Jesus came, it helped us. But once God sent the, sorry. <laughs> and once God sent Jesus, people could, people could have living water flowing through the dry parts of their lives. My application is God is like the ocean, Jesus is the rivers, and we are the streams of the world. We are supposed to branch off of the river and spread living water throughout all of the world all leading back to God, our source. I want to spread the living water and lead people to the source while staying hydrated myself. And my prayer was, God, would you help me stay connected to you, the source? Would you help me to be a stream of living water? Would you help the living water flow through me so I can lead others to the living water and everlasting life? You give, and that will never run dry. Amen. Come on. So good. So good. That's reading for transformation. It's engaging the scriptures for transformation. Dallas Willard says this, 
I love his quote. He says, scripture is not intended to be an instrument of self-improvement or a source of spiritual performance pressure. It's a testament to God's love and grace, inviting us into a transforming relationship with him. When we engage those scriptures, God begins to transform us as we engage his word with a heart, letting him stir the deep things that he's trying to say to us through his spirit in our hearts. We walk away from that transformative reading burning with God's love and his presence. And the last thing, and this one, this one has really changed the way that I've experienced God through the scriptures. Because a lot of the times I, I went to the scriptures to get something and I walked away with a lot of knowledge but not a lot of presence. And I remember when I was in college, I was, it was a weird time for me. I don't know why. It, it was my, I was 18 years old. Um, it was my first election year and it was Hillary and Trump um, and everybody kept apologizing to me like, I'm so sorry that you have to do this. I'm like, oh my gosh, so much pressure. Everybody on campus was going crazy when I was at college. And I was like, oh, here we go. We got an election. It's my first election. I feel all the pressure of that. I also was struggling because I was like in the middle of like a class on the Pentateuch, the Torah, and my professor said a lot of words that I did not understand. I was struggling to comprehend. I walked out of that class like I didn't, he lost me at Genesis 1-1. I'm like, I don't even know where to go from here. So I was feeling the pressure because I'm like, I want to I wanna be a pastor. I want to love people. I want to, you know, I want to do the right thing with my life. And I just was like feeling like I'm done. I don't want to be here. And so I remember going back to my, um, my dorm and it was, it was super hot in my dorm for some reason. So I laid on the floor with my face to the ground. I was like, poor me. You know, I was like, this is terrible. You know, so I'm laid out flat and there was a vent right there. And I was like letting the vent hit, you know, the air hit my face and, I remember just feeling like so much anxiety and pressure and I was just like, God, just like come meet with me. I'm like, I'm struggling here. I'm like, and I just remember him saying like, just that verse, like, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. So I literally started to just say that under my breath. Like as I was just laying there, I was like, be still and know he's God. Be still and know that he's God. And something happened. I began to experience the person of Jesus. I be, it wasn't just words anymore. It was like I was interacting with a person. So we have to actually recognize that scripture is an invitation to intimacy. It's an invitation for you to experience the person of Jesus. A lot of the times we think of God's word as a book, but the Bible actually teaches us that God's word isn't a book, it's a person, and his name is Jesus. It says that in John 1, that he was at the beginning with God, and that the word was made flesh in Jesus. So when we're encountering the scripture, we're engaging with them, we're actually engaging with the person of Jesus. And that changed everything for me because I realized that I'm not just reading words on a paper, I'm meeting Jesus who loves me, who died for me, who gave everything for me. And these words are like his invitation to be close and to be transformed by him. So I remember just sitting there being like, be still and know. And I'm like, I can be still and know because these words are not just words, they're a person. Jesus is our peace, our Prince of Peace. And I just began to experience the person of Jesus through the scriptures. One of the saddest, I think, moments of scripture is right after Jesus does a miracle, he, he heals this guy on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees, they're all like up in arms about that. I can't believe you helped somebody. You know, like, come on, guys. But they had studied their entire lives to know the scriptures, their entire lives to know every in and out, backwards, forwards, upside down. They knew the scriptures like nobody's business. They could quote the entire uh, Torah. And some of them, the really, really knowledgeable Pharisees, they could quote the whole entire Old Testament. It's like word for word. That's insane. And there's this moment where they're giving Jesus a hard time. And this is what he says. It's so sad. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. They were experiencing the word that they had learned their whole life in a person right in front of them, and they missed it. He's like, you studied the scriptures diligently, and I'm here to have a relationship with you, but you haven't come to me for life. And I just realized that I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be somebody that just studies the scriptures just to know the scriptures for scripture's sake. I want to know Jesus. I want to be transformed by him. I want to encounter his presence because when I do, everything changes. And I'll close with this. There was a moment a few years ago, I think it was three years ago now, my father-in-law passed away. It was like the hardest moment of, of our lives. And especially for me, I don't know why, but I just kind of, 
dipped down into like a deep depression and I was anxious and I was just making stuff at home really tough. And it was really bad. At some point, my wife was just like, I haven't even got to mourn like because you're struggling so bad, I have to pick you up. It was so bad. And I remember it was like the, the middle of the night and we were just struggling, not because our marriage was bad, we just, I was down in the dumps. And my wife was trying to pull me up and I'm heavy, uh, you know, like so she's like, come on. I remember I woke up in the middle of the night and I just felt like God just like woke me up. And I was like, okay, like what's going on? And I, I just felt like I woke my wife Veronica up and I was like, God, God woke me up. I think he just like wants to speak to what we're going through right now. And she's like, okay. And I'm like, well, I don't, you got something? Cause I don't got anything. He just woke me up. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, God fix this problem. We're struggling, you know, you know, do your thing. And I just like, so we stopped and we just waited on the Lord. We're like, Lord, and he just put Psalm 91 and it's early in the morning. And I'm starting to doubt a little bit. I'm like, is there a Psalm 91? I'm like, I don't know if I'm familiar with it, but I'm like, there is a Psalm 91, but I didn't know why that he, he put Psalm 91 on my heart. I have no idea why. But all I know is that God was just like, I wanna to speak to you right now. So I just said, hey, let's just read this and let's just let the words be what they are. And let's just sit with the truth, the, the person of Jesus, like he is the word, like let him come in. So we sat there and we read Psalm 91 and we're like, oh, like when I read Psalm 91, I tear up, I'm like, gosh, because I remember as we read, we just wept because God is so good. And we weren't experiencing words that were just like comforting. We were experiencing a person and his name was Jesus. And his word wasn't just some knowledge or information grab. It was a person that was saying, I know you and I love you. And this is an invitation for you to come near to me. Sometimes we take these spiritual practices like giving and scripture and we make them our own thing to be performance driven and to make us good, like to make us better Christians or whatever that is. But what God is saying is that these are, these are on ramps. These are invitations for you to come to me because I love you. So as I began to look at the scriptures like this, my life was changed because I started encountering God's presence through his word. Now, every time I read the scriptures, I, even if it's like, you know, 10 pages of lineages and names, I'm thinking of it like, man, this is the story where Jesus comes and saves us. This is the story where I find myself in it. This is the love story that God has written for us. And sometimes we have to pick up the Bible and instead of reading it like a newspaper, we read it like a love letter. Because when I, when I pick up a newspaper, there's a particular purpose that I'm picking it up for. I wanna know what's going on. But when, my, when, when I write a love letter to my wife, I'm inviting her into my heart for her on the page. It's an invitation for her to see the hiddenness of my love for her that, that's in here, but I had to get out on pages. And that's what I feel like God's word is for us. It's the hidden love that he has in his heart that he said, I need to put this on pages for you to experience. So sometimes we pick it up like a glossier index and we're trying to figure out the meanings, but God is saying, no, primarily it's the place where you know how deep my love is for you and how much if you come in contact with that love, it will change you from the inside out and everything in your life. So what I wanna do is I wanna close with doing exactly what I did in that, the middle of the night that night and read Psalm 91 together. And what I want you to do is I want you to strip all the performance you possibly can out. Don't try to understand it in some deep way. Don't try to find the hidden meanings. Let the love letter speak. Let it wash over you. Let Jesus come to you in these words because he is the word. And allow these scriptures to transform whatever situation you're going through right now. If you're struggling, if you're sad, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, if you're going through a situation that you wish you weren't going through, allow Jesus through these scriptures to meet you like he met me and Veronica on that night. And now every time I have a struggle, this week I've been stressed out, it was Psalm 1 and Psalm 91. And I was like, Lord, I'm gonna allow myself, my heart, to experience you in a powerful way. Would you stand with me? But Pastor Tim Keller said this about his messages. He said that a, the goal of his sermons is that after every sermon, people would want to worship Jesus more. I'm like, that is amazing. I love that. That they would fall in love with Jesus and want to worship him more deeply. And that's what happened on the road to Emmaus. When Jesus spoke the scriptures and opened it to them, 
It was the living word speaking the living word and it burned within their hearts and it made them fall more in love with Jesus. And it made them want to worship him more. So my heart right now is that we wouldn't just read the words of life and walk away without encountering the presence and responding through our worship. So as I read, I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And I know because it's God. It's not me. It's not my message. It's not what I prepared. It's him. It's his words. It's Jesus. That as I read, some of you are going to experience Jesus coming to you and reminding you how much he loves you. And you're going to need some prayer. And we're here for that. We're, I'm going to invite you down. We're going to sing a song. But as I read these things, if you feel like God is, he's just calling you forward. Like, I see you. I know you. I love you. I, I'm, I'm with you. Allow us to come and pray for you. So just, if, even if as I read, like something's just, that burning feeling is happening in your heart or you're feeling like, man, I need prayer. Just come forward. We love to pray for you. But let's, let's engage our heart really quick through this. Don't read with me. I'll take care of it for you. But allow yourself to experience the presence and the person of Jesus through these words. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No no plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them, and I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. That's Jesus. And he's inviting us to encounter him through these words, through his scriptures. I want to pray for us and allow our prayer team to come forward. Father, We ask, Lord, that you would meet us here. That the words we find in your scriptures wouldn't just be words, but they'd be the person of Jesus coming in, Lord, loving us. God, as we encounter you, Lord, will the things of the world grow strangely dim as we look at your, your, your glory and your grace, Father? Would these words, Lord, burn within our hearts, would the scriptures just show us that you're reaching out, reminding us that, that it's your love letter to us. It's the story of the great scandal of love and grace. Father, as we close this morning, with those areas in our lives where we feel anxious, depressed, scared, fearful, Lord, oh, what's your word? Psalm 91, would you hide us in the shelter of your wings? As we call upon you, God, as we come up for prayer, Lord, would you answer our prayers? In Jesus' name. If you need prayer, we're down here. We would love to pray with you. Please come forward. Thank you so much for joining us today online. We want to stay connected with you. Be sure to fill out a Connect card. If you want to know more about what's going on here at Foursquare, check out our web or app. We look forward to seeing you each Sunday at 8.30 or 10.30 a.m. Have a blessed week.